Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? As our thoughts center on him, we're conscious of the beautiful day which he's given to us, of the warmth of that sunshine, something we haven't experienced for quite a few days now. We've seen new shoots springing up from the garden we've sensed that first touch of spring in the air. And it won't be long before the leaves of the trees begin to fall and new ones take their place. The sense of the fact that God is doing something new in his creation, that's a feeling which too we sense in our own hearts of what he is going to do with us as his people gathered together. Father, as we think upon you, as our minds dwell on you, we are aware, Father, that you are so much higher than our thoughts, that your ways are not our ways, that, Father, so great is your power that we are almost struggling to understand it. Your love is so awesome that even a slice of it, as it were, is almost too much for us to take on board. As we think of the way you bless us, Father, day after day, hour by hour, we're conscious of the fact that you are a very generous Father and we are but poor helpless children receiving all the time. Father, just something of who you are, 
we acknowledge you to be the Lord. We acknowledge you to be our Lord this morning. Father, even your name is glorious and you are sovereign. You created and formed the galaxies around us and that is again just an example of your handiwork. Father, we come this morning as a family to worship the head of that family. Father, we praise your name. We bless you for you are glorious to behold. Father, we thank you that you share that glory with us by the things that we can see around us which you have made and which you have given to us. And yes, Father, we look at each other and we see you in one another and we say it is good to see the glory of the Lord in our brothers and sisters. Father, accept the praise of our hearts of our minds and of our bodies this morning. And Father, we would say together now that you have all the glory for all that we give to you this morning. For what we give to you is only a sample of what you have given to us. And we say, Father, receive from us this morning. And we bless you that even as we give, we know that you'll be receiving and that you too will be giving to us almost more than we can measure. And so, Father, we come as a grateful people, a thankful people this morning, in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's turn back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, page 178 in the Good News Bible. <clears throat> we seem to be traveling fairly slowly through Deuteronomy, but I think that means that God wants us to be quite sure we've grasped each part of it before we move on to the next. Chapter 7, then, of the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which you are going to occupy, and he will drive many nations out of it. As you advance, he will drive out seven nations larger and more powerful than you. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. When the Lord your God places these people in your power and you defeat them, you must put them all to death. Do not make an alliance with them or show them any mercy. Do not marry any of them, and do not let your children marry any of them, because then they would lead your children away from the Lord to worship other gods. If that happens, the Lord will be angry with you and destroy you at once. <clears throat> so then, tear down their altars, break their sacred stone pillars in pieces, Cut down the symbols of their goddess, Asherah, and burn their idols. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved you and wanted to keep the promise that he made to your ancestors. That is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. Remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful. He will keep his covenant and show his constant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commands but he will not hesitate to punish those who hate him. So now, obey what you have been taught. Obey all the laws that I have given you today. If you listen to these commands and obey them faithfully, then the Lord your God will continue to keep his covenant with you and will show you his constant love as he promised your ancestors. He will love you and bless you 
so that you will increase in number and have many children. He will bless your fields so that you will have corn, wine and olive oil. And he will bless you by giving you many cattle and sheep. He will give you all these blessings in the land that he promised your ancestors he would give it to you. No people in the world will be as richly blessed as you. None of you nor any of your cattle will be sterile. The Lord will protect you from all sickness and he will not bring on, on you any of the dreadful diseases that you experienced in Egypt but he will bring them on all your enemies. Destroy every nation that the Lord your God places in your power and do not show them any mercy. Do not worship their gods, for that would be fatal. Do not tell yourselves that these peoples outnumber you and that you cannot drive them out. Do not be afraid of them. Remember what the Lord your God did to the king of Egypt and to all his people. Remember the terrible plagues that you saw with your own eyes, the miracles and wonders and the great power and strength by which the Lord your God set you free. In the same way that he destroyed those Egyptians, he will now destroy all these people that you now fear. He will even cause panic among them and will destroy those who escape and go into hiding. So do not be afraid of these people. The Lord your God is with you. He is a great God and one to be feared. Little by little, he will drive out these nations as you advance. You will not be able to destroy them all at once. For if you did, the number of wild animals would increase and be a threat to you. The Lord will put your enemies in your power and make them panic until they are destroyed. He will put their kings in your power. You will kill them and they will be forgotten. No one will be able to stop you. You will destroy everyone. Burn their idols. Do not desire the silver or gold that is on them. And do not take it for yourselves. If you do, that will be fatal. Because the Lord hates idolatry. Do not bring any of these idols into your homes or the same curse will be on you that is on them. You must hate and despise these idols because they are under the Lord's curse. The Lord loved you. Let's sing hymn number 411. Come let us sing of a wonderful love tender and true. 411.
Let's talk to the Lord before I talk to you about him. Let's pray. Father, we've listened to preaching so many times that we could have become used to it. So we pray this morning that you will freshen us all up and give us a very sensitive ear that we may hear what you want to say to us, all of us, including the preacher. Lord, we are absolutely dependent upon you now that your Holy Spirit may take the words written so long ago and for such a different situation and make them real and relevant now so that they become a revelation of your truth to us. Lord, fix our wandering attention. Save us from those stray thoughts that so easily distract and help us so to look into this chapter that it will never be quite the same passage to us again. And we shall recall what you said to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we take our daughter back to college at Winchester or go to visit her, just outside the city I often look to the left where there's a great natural depression in the fields, a kind of huge green amphitheater. And I remember that in June 1944, there stood in the middle of that vast arena a man called General Dwight Eisenhower, and round him were gathered all the paratroopers who were going to go in first to establish the bridgeheads at either end of the invasion area, and if possible, hold the bridges until the army got there. And with tears in his eyes, General Eisenhower sent them on their mission. Behind his speech, which expressed confidence in victory, there lay a whole lot of thought, planning, calculation. What were the chances of them getting a bridgehead within the first few hours? Would they win? Were the factors on their side? In particular, that general had had to face the very difficult decision to postpone the whole thing for 24 hours because the weather seemed to be against them. But finally, he'd taken the decision and he faced them with the dangers that were awaiting them over the channel. He faced them with the strength that they believed they had in the army that had been building up in the south coast of England over the last few months. And then he bade them go. Now Moses at Moab giving what we call the book of Deuteronomy is doing precisely what Eisenhower did for those troops. He has weighed up very carefully the resources that are for them, the dangers that are against them. And he is now presenting them with the chances of their getting in and getting what God has promised them and taking the land over. And this is a kind of rally speech, chapter 7, laying out before them their four greatest assets and their four greatest dangers as they invaded the land. He faces them squarely with two facts. Number one, the land into which you're going is already occupied. And second, when you find it occupied, you will also find that you are outnumbered. That's the reality of the situation. You're not going in to take over an empty land. It is already occupied and you are already outnumbered. The saints are not fools. They face facts and they face the magnitude of the task before them, and then they begin to weigh up the pros and cons. Jesus said a man is a fool if he goes into battle without sitting down first, counting his troops, counting the possible cost, weighing up the pros and cons, reviewing his resources, defining the dangers, and only then is he ready to go in. Well, now that's what Moses is making them do. And I'm going to pass them on to you this morning as the four greatest assets we have and the four greatest dangers we have in getting into all that God wants us to enjoy. The first great asset we have is this, the power of the Lord. That's what we've got. And that means that the scales are already tipped in our favor. And Moses begins not by questioning the success of their campaign. He begins by saying, the Lord will bring you in. Why? Because of his power. 
Now, I want you to notice very carefully how God exercises his power. We can make mistakes about this and fall into a trap because we don't realize what God will do with that power and what he will not do with that power. He will not use it to fight your battles for you. He will not use it to remove temptation from you. He will not use it to remove difficulties from your path. Let's just see carefully what the power of the Lord does when you are going into what God has promised. God says, I will put the enemy within your power, but you deal with him. In other words, I'll cut the problem down to a size that you can handle. That's the power of the Lord that's with us. Not a power that's going to do our job for us. But a power that will ensure that everything we face is cut down to our size so that we can tackle it. The picture that came to my mind since I went to a boarding school where a good deal of bullying went on was of a large boy. I'm trying not to think of a specific boy, but I'm afraid he keeps coming into my mind. <laughs> Um, of a large bully who used to get the first years and that's where I began and used to get us and deal with us and the picture that came into my mind was of a bigger boy than the bully holding his hands behind his back and say, saying to me now come on sock it to him <laughs> and that's the picture that comes right out of this passage God says I'm not going to get rid of all these people for you I'm not going to fight your battles for you. I'm going to cut them down to your size and it's you who've got to wipe them out. I'll put them within your power if you will put them out of your reach. And this is a profound lesson which comes right through to the New Testament and right through to the battles that you're facing today. Have you asked God to fight the battle for you? Then you're asking for something the power of the Lord will not do. Are you asking for him to remove that temptation from you? He's not promised to do that. Are you asking him to take the difficulties out of your life? The power of the Lord will not do that. But are you asking God, when the temptation comes, will you keep it the size that I can bear and will you provide a way of escape for me? He'll say, yes, I'll do that. And if you're saying, Lord, this gigantic problem that seems too big for me, will you cut it down to the size I can tackle? Yes, he will do that. He's not going to excuse us from the battle or the invasion, but he's saying the power of the Lord will cut down to size, your size, the things you're up against. I hope you find that an encouragement. I hope you don't feel, oh dear, so I've got to fight. I hope you don't feel that it's unfair of God to leave you to do your part. It's his way of using you in such a way that you grow in stature and that you develop but he has promised that his power will limit the power of the enemy and put them within your grasp and reach. But, and here we come to the small print, which must be read, that power can be neutralized. And it can be neutralized in a very simple way, and that is by compromise with the enemy. As soon as that happens, then the power of the Lord will turn against you. A picture came into my mind to try and make this vivid. It's an imaginary situation. I hope it won't offend anybody. But I imagine this picture, that I and my family were homeless, but that we'd managed to get a damp, dark cellar under someone else's house and my children and my wife were in that cellar. And that some rich man came to me and said, you know, I have a lovely country home out in Surrey and I want you and your family to have it. You can have it rent-free. It's a beautiful place. There is just one snag. There are squatters in the house and they've made the place filthy and they're living in a wrong way too and they're living by stealing. And the whole place is just going to wreck and ruin. Now you can have that house provided you get rid of the squatters. And here is the eviction order and they're bound to go on the basis of that. But here's the house, here's the eviction order, but I'm leaving you to get rid of the squatters. And so I make a preliminary exploration, go down and see. 
And when I meet the squatters and realize that they're pretty tough young people, and when I uh, talk to them, I begin to feel sorry for them because they've got nowhere to go. So finally I say to them, look, I'll tell you what, it's a big house. Supposing you keep in that wing, and, and I'll move my family into this wing, and, and we'll share it. We'll try and keep out of each other's way. And so we do this. And after we've moved in, I notice two things begin to happen. I notice that the dirt has a way of spreading from their part to our part. Have you ever noticed that cleanliness doesn't spread? It, it's such a simple, obvious truth that a clean half of a house never makes the dirty half clean. It's always the other way around. And if you want scripture for that, read one of the passages in Nehemiah where somebody or he proposed a conundrum. Does the clean make the dirty clean or does the dirty make the clean dirty? And the second thing I notice is that my children are frequently slipping into their wing and picking up their habits and coming back with them so that in the next generation we're all back to the original state that the house was in. All right, it's an imaginary picture. I've just tried to relate something that you can identify with. The man who is giving me that house is saying, I want that house clean right out. And if I make any alliance, any kind of armistice, any kind of treaty with the squatters, and if my children do the same and become related to them, then that man's original intention in giving us his house has been foiled. Now at this point I want to deal with a very real question which has often been thrown at God and at the Bible. How can a good God order the Israelites to kill men, women, and children? Some people say if that is a true record of God, then God is not good. But it's more popular to say today the record can't be true and it's one of the proofs that the Bible is not inspired, that it says things about God that couldn't possibly tr be true of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Well, we can only tackle that by realizing one thing. All those ites, the Hittites, the Gergeshites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and all the other ites, all of them, were not a bunch of seven innocent peoples who happened to be living in the wrong place. They were not like somebody living in a little bungalow in the country here that has to be pulled down because somebody else has planned a motorway right through it. They were not innocent people. Indeed, the more archaeology has revealed and the more you study the Bible at depth, the more you discover those people had so spoiled that land, so fouled it up, that they had forfeited the right to be there. They had even behaved in a way whereby they had forfeited the right to live. This had been foreseen. It was not unexpected. When God spoke to Abraham years previously, he said something which many people have missed. In the very same chapter that Abraham believed God, it says this, You will live to a ripe old age, die in peace and be buried. But it will be four generations before your descendants come back here because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished. In other words, those people had to be put to death, whether the Israelites did it or someone else. They had forfeited their right to live. The problem is that when God tells us to cut something right out, our human hearts want to make an armistice. And we want to say, well, can't we just leave this in that little room? The New Testament is as full of commands of God to put to death as the Old Testament is. Only in the New Testament we are not told to put human beings to death, men, women, or children. In the Old Testament they had to put to death the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and all the other ites. In the New Testament, put to death the old man. You see, my heart was not empty when Jesus came in, and your heart was not empty when Jesus came in, was it? 
And one of the difficulties of leading someone to Christ is that there is so much there before you get him to Christ. There's so much to clear out of the way. There are so many other things that have crowded in. That man's life is full already. It's occupied and Jesus is outnumbered. And you've got to battle your way in. If you're going to possess the land, you've got to dispossess the land, whether it's your own heart or somebody else's heart. There is a dispossession before the possession. And that is where we so often come to terms and say to the squatters that have got in, you stay there and we'll live here. And it doesn't work. And the power of the Lord is neutralized. And the power that could cut that problem down to size turns around and the power is directed at us instead of those who are making our problems for us. Here then is the first great asset we've got. Cling to it. The power of the Lord is ours to cut every problem down to size. But if we at any point side with the enemy, then we find that God is on the other side and we're on the wrong side. Now the second asset that we have in this chapter, the love of the Lord. The secret of any army lies first in its strength. We've looked at that. It lies secondly in its loyalty for queen and country or whatever. Now the great loyalty of the army of the Lord is the love of the Lord. And that is our second greatest asset. And this is one of those passages that just leaps out of Deuteronomy. Verse 7. Charles Wesley has sung about it by saying this. He has loved, he has loved, because he would love. And the aspect of the love of God that I want you to grasp at this moment is that the love of God is not dependent on your lovability but on his loyalty. Aren't you glad about that? Just take a look around at other people in the congregation for a moment. Go on, look at somebody else. <laughs> How much lovability did you see? Look into the pulpit if you like. How much <laughs> lovability do you see? The incredible truth is... God did not love us because we are lovable, but because he is loving. That's the first point to grasp. And therein lies our security, that I don't have to be lovable. God loved me because he would love me. And that produces the loyalty necessary to go in to possess the land because God loves. And the other side of God's love is this. That God not only loves me because he would love, but he loves me because he would be loyal. It is not only lovable, it is loyal. Romance without responsibility is not true love. Sex outside marriage is not true love. Because romance without responsibility doesn't have the element of loyalty in it. I think we've now got about 14 or 16 weddings lined up for this year, maybe even more. It seems to increase daily. But in each of these weddings in this building, two people will stand and they will both say, I will. And the wedding service is not just a formal ceremony. It's not just a way of having a Christian version of a legal rite. It is to inject into the love an element of loyalty through thick and thin. It is to seek to lift that love to the level of God's love. I love you because I love you and I will be loyal to you and not just because you are lovable. That removes any insecurity from a marriage, any insecurity in a husband's heart or a wife's heart. I wonder if I'm still as lovable to my partner. The words I will were not dependent on being lovable. They were dependent on being loved and on loyalty. Now that's the love of God. And that's our second greatest asset. It is love based on truth. That's an old-fashioned word that's gone out, but truth means a true relationship of loyalty. I give you my truth. 
That's the biggest wedding gift you could have. Truth. But even God's love can be spurned just as God's power can be neutralized. And again we read the small print. And the small print says, God has said to you, I will love. And that love can last 30,000 years to a thousand generations. It's a long, long love. And 30,000 years comfortably covers us since the days of Deuteronomy. That love goes on and on. But the small print says that that love requires a response, I will. God says, I will love you and honor you. And the response from us as his bride is, I will love, honor, and obey you. And to those who love and obey him, his love can go through 30,000 years and more. But to those who don't return his love, his commands become irksome and sooner or later love turns to hate. It is a tragic fact of human nature that we can really only hate those that we can love. We've got to have a strong passion for someone before we can hate them. And love turns to hate. That's why some marriages are heaven and others are hell. Because love and hate are the two sides of the same passion. And where the loyalty goes, then love turns to hate. And the commands of one become irksome to the other. And if God has said, I will love you because I love you and because I've made a promise to your forefathers and I won't go back on my word, I've said I will and I'll stay with it. When we don't respond to that with loving obedience, do you know what happens? His commands become irksome. We begin to dislike him. Why do you keep telling us to do this or not to do that? And hate begins to build up. And I wish you'd get out of my life, Lord. And that neutralizes his love and spurns it. And God says, look, I called you and I loved you because I wanted you to be special. My people, my own people, I want you to be different. I want you to be mine, my special people. I loved you, not because you were big or marvelous or because you had anything. How odd of God to choose the Jews. They were the smallest nation on earth. They were living in the cellars in Egypt. They had nothing. And God said, come, I want to bring you into a lovely land. I love you. Do you love me? Do you love me enough to obey me? Don't spoil my love. It will have to turn to anger if you hate me. So there's the second great asset we have, the power of the Lord, which can be neutralized by compromise. The love of the Lord, which can be spurned by disobedience. What's the third great asset we have as we go forward? It is the blessing of the Lord. Every army needs an incentive. In the First World War, the incentive was, this is the war to end wars. And I'm afraid many went off to that war, volunteered for it, with the incentive of ending war forever. Their hopes were dashed. And the cenotaph that was erected for a memorial for their dead now bears on it the names or the dates of another world war that came not too long afterwards. Men went off into the Second World War to fight for peace in our time, to fight for peace in our land, for peace in Europe. You've got to have an incentive. You've got to have something worth fighting for. Well, then what did God give through Moses to Israel? He gave them the promise of tremendous blessing. And when you read it through, their hearts must have been really thumping as they listened after 40 years living in a desert. You're going to go into a place where you'll have lots and lots of children and don't worry, none of them will be hungry. You'll have fields that will produce wine and corn and olive oil, the three main foods in Palestine. Even your animals will have twins and triplets and, and the whole place will be just full of life. And furthermore, I'll see that the one thing that robs you of life will not creep in disease. None of the sicknesses that used to waste your families and your animals in Egypt will enter those holy, healthy hills. Do you know, in Egypt it is low-lying, it is humid, it is not healthy. There are lots of insects there, there are lots of 
diseases associated with low-lying, swampy, humid ground. But up in them, their hills, Moses says, you're going to have a healthy time. None of these sicknesses. So that not only will you have more life, but you'll have less death. That's what I'm offering you. That's the blessing I hold before you. And it's a lovely blessing now. It's an intriguing blessing for this reason. The religions of the ites who lived there, the Canaanites and all the others, was a fertility religion. You can study it in the history books. It was a religion built around fertility. That's why some of the rites were so foul. That's why some of the symbols that they were told to destroy were phallic symbols. They even got to the point where prostitution was regarded as an act of praise to God. That's the kind of religion they had. And they did it all for one reason. Because they believed that this was the way to get fertility and to avoid sterility. This was the, the way to have lots of children. This was the way to have good crops. This was the way to avoid disease. All these things they thought came from these fertility gods. They're named in this chapter. And God says, look, when you get in there, you'll have more children than they ever had. You'll have better crops than they ever had. You'll have less disease than they ever had. That's what I'm offering you, the blessing that's waiting for you when you've invaded and occupied the land. But you'll get it from me. So once again, here comes the small print. Whatever you do, don't touch their fertility cults. Don't get involved in any way with what they do. Keep off their religion. Don't get mixed up with their religion at all. If I can give you a very simple illustration. There are poor people who read their horoscope every day and who hope that what the horoscope promises is going to come true for them. Don't you ever read your horoscope. Don't touch it. Don't have anything to do with it. If it promises blessing, then God promises you more blessing. Stay on the right side and let God bless you with all the things that are promised by gad and luck and fortune. Let God look after your needs. The fourth asset we have is the greatness of the Lord. For the final question we've got is the morale of an army. You need strength in an army. You need loyalty in an army. You need incentive in an army. But the fourth thing you need is morale. And one of the worst things that can happen to an army is in the middle of a battle seeing all the enemy forces and the outnumbered enemy, that they're outnumbered by the enemy. The worst thing that can happen is panic and a disorderly rout or even an orderly retreat takes place. Our family were laughing at a joke about a, a man engaged in such an orderly retreat and bumped into someone and uh, spoke to him, not noticing his rank, and spoke to him rather familiarly. And the man said, don't you know I'm a staff officer? And this poor Tommy said, my, I didn't know I'd got that far back from the front line. <laughs> you can take it how you like. Morale is very important great danger of panic, of running. Now here is a very humorous situation. You've just left at a modern illustration, but look at the humor in the last section of this chapter. Moses said, you know, the situation could arise when you're looking at the enemy and you're panicking and the enemy is looking at your God and panicking. Isn't that ludicrous? that they should be looking in your direction in panic and you should be looking in their direction in panic, but at least they're looking higher than you are. And if only you looked up instead of along, you wouldn't panic. The answer to panic is to talk to yourself. But what you say to yourself is terribly important. If you talk to yourself about the enemy, if you talk to yourself about the difficulties, if you talk to yourself about the problems, I know full well what happens. You go down and down and down. Morale is a question of what you say to yourself. And Moses said, when you feel you're outnumbered, when you're looking horizontally, look up and see that God is so great that they're running scared. You don't have any need to fear. It's they who need to fear. The panic will be on their side. Why? Because our God is great. Great. So great that they'll be frightened stiff 
of him when you go in. Now that's one of our greatest assets, that God is so great. And he's so great that he can order the speed of the battle. Moses said he's not going to give you the land all at once. If he cleared the land in one fell swoop, wild beasts would spring up and you'd have another enemy. He's going to enable you to clear it little by little. And as you advance, he'll cut the enemy down to size by filling them with panic. Now, there are many of us who want to win the victory in one fell swoop. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we could go away from this morning and say, this morning, hallelujah, in church, I got the complete victory over every difficulty, over every temptation. I'm going out to a promised land and I've got the whole of it this morning. Hallelujah. I can imagine you all tearing down the drive in front, singing at the top of your voice if that had happened. But God will not do that. He will bring us into the land step by step, little by little, so that we can cope with what he gives us. And as we advance, so the enemy will panic because they know that God is on our side. Now once again, you can distort the greatness of God. And even though in the light of that greatness, he says kings will be forgotten, their names will be forgotten, and they have been. We don't know the names of the kings of these seven peoples who were driven out. They've, they've vanished. Kings have vanished in the dust because of the greatness of God. Read the small print again, and it says, whatever you do, don't bring their idols into your homes. Why not? Because an idol cuts God down to size. An idol can never convey his greatness. I haven't seen an idol in the world yet that came anywhere near demonstrating to me the greatness of God. I read early this morning this passage in Psalm 115. Listen. Why should the nations ask, where is your God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wishes. Their gods are made of silver and gold formed by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound. Those who made them and who trust them will become like the idols they have made. Now what does that say? It says that those who made them will have mouths that cannot speak and ears that cannot hear and hands that cannot feel. Yes, that will happen to those who make idols. Let me now reverse the passage. I don't know if you find it helpful, but you might. It's a little hint for Bible study to take a passage and turn it back to front and read it and see what it says. Do you ever, do you ever try that? Read it backwards or read it upside down or read it wrong way round and see what comes out. I'll tell you what I mean. Our God has no mouth but can speak. Our God doesn't have eyes but he can see. He doesn't have ears but he can hear. He doesn't have a nose but he can smell. He doesn't have hands but he can feel. He doesn't have feet but he can walk. And he can make a sound. And those who trust him will become like him. And their mouths will open and speak and their ears will open and hear. Their eyes will open and see. The great danger is to think of God as less than God. For idols we can read ideas, but some people's ideas of God are just too small. J.B. Phillips' most famous book, hope you've read it. Your God is too small just talks about the littleness of some people's ideas of God. Some people just think of God as a kind of Santa Claus up in heaven. Oh, they've missed his greatness. Some people think of him just like a policeman writing down in a notebook. Ear, ear, what have you been doing? Oh, what a small view of God. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, says the psalmist. You can't magnify God, he's too great. But it means get a big view, look through a magnifying glass, get a big view of God. The greatness of God is our greatest asset. So let's not be turned to any idols. Anything less than God that will occupy the central place in our affection or our attention. For then God's greatness is not with us. 
and the enemy will not panic. It's time I've finished, so let me close by saying there are just two things this passage tells me. And I want you to get the encouragement of one of them and the challenge of the other. The encouragement is this. God is on our side. That's the encouragement. That means his power is on our side. His love is on our side. His blessing is on our side. His greatness is on our side. That's the encouragement in this chapter. Here's Moses talking to the troops before they go in. These are our assets. These are our resources. And therefore he can bring us in and will bring us in. We've got all the resources we need. As Paul was later to cry from his heart, if God is for us, who can be against us? It's unanswerable. If God is on our side, we're bound to win. Or are we? John Wesley, as he lay dying after riding around this country and leading hundreds of thousands of people to Christ, pushing back the enemy in life after life. I was down in Plymouth on Wednesday evening in the parish church, which is used as the cathedral of that city, and there in the ceiling are little plaques of famous people who've influenced that part of the world, and among them there was John Wesley. And when he went down there, he found a place full of wreckers and smugglers and all kinds of things. And he went into that land and he pressed the enemy back. He was attacked. He was dragged by the hair through the streets until a fisherwoman, large, fat fisherwoman, much bigger than himself, for John West, who was just over five feet, came and put a big fat arm around him and looked at the gang and said, touch him if you dare, <laughs> and brought him through that crisis. But he went down there and he pressed the enemy back. Yes, the land was full of things that needed to be cleared. And among the Cornish miners, John Wesley cleared so much. But at the end of his life, having preached his last sermon at Leatherhead, just a few miles away from here, and maybe you've seen the plaque in the, on the main borough building there, which is on the site of where he preached his last sermon. Four days later he died. And as he died, his last words were these. The best of all is, God is with us. And he'd said that at the end of a life of fighting to get into this land and to push the enemy out of it. Yes, the best of all is, God is with us. But the word of challenge needs to be remembered. And it's this. The challenge is, God is on our side. Don't change sides that's the challenge don't move over to the enemy be ruthless with the enemy put to death the enemy cut the enemy right out don't move over because if you change sides and make any alliance with the enemy whose side is God on then so the real question is not is God on our side but are, are we on his and are we going to stay there who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? That's the challenge into battle.